Oh, it's recording. Is that it? Yeah, it's recording. Okay, great. So, there you go. I'm just gonna leave it recording. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, alumni, uh, faculty, and students alike. 
I would like to thank you for attending this event tonight. We hope that you find our presentation informative and interesting. We are here to demonstrate the reasons why China will prove to be a more resilient economy with better long-term prospects than India, and that China will be a major player in the global economy for a long time to come. For many centuries, China stood as one of the world's leading economies. Outpacing the rest of the world, primarily in the arts and sciences, but in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the country was plagued by civil unrest, major famines, foreign occupation, and military defeats. In the post-World War II era, the communists under Mao established an autocratic socialist system that ensured China's sovereignty, but also imposed strict controls over everyday life. After 1978, his successor, Deng Xiaoping, and other leaders focused on market-oriented economic development and the, by 2000, output had quadrupled. In the past 25 years, China's economy has evolved from a centrally planned system that was largely closed to international trade to a more market-oriented economy that has a rapidly growing private sector and is now a major player in the global economy. Reform started in the late 1970s with the phasing out of the practice of collectivized agriculture and expanded to include the gradual liberalization of prices, fiscal decentralization, increased autonomy for state enterprises, a diversified banking system, the development of stock markets, the rapid growth of the non-state sector, and the opening to foreign trade and investment. On March 15th of this year, the annual session of China's National People's Congress ratified the 11th five-year plan which calls for a 20% reduction in energy consumption per unit of GDP by 2010, as well as an estimated 45% increase in GDP by 2010. Provisions included in the plan that focus on the industrial sector state that the main goal is not expansion in scale, but more importantly, structural upgrading that aims to turn China's big industry into a global powerhouse. Other central aspects of the plan focus on building an innovation-oriented country and implementing the strategy of developing the country with talent. It is also important to note that for the first time, there is a chapter solely devoted to the services sector. Along with having the largest population in the world, more than 1.3 billion, China will, by 2010, produce more science and engineering doctorates than the United States. The restructuring of the economy and resulting efficiency gains have contributed to more than a tenfold increase in GDP since 1978. Measured on a purchasing power parity basis, China in 2005 stood as the second largest economy in the world after the United States. Foreign investment remains a strong element in China's remarkable expansion in world trade and has been an important factor in growth of urban jobs. China's 9% growth rate over the past 25 years is the fastest economic acceleration in world history. Average incomes have quadrupled and 300 million people were lifted out of poverty. China's more than $1.6 trillion economic output is expected to triple in 15 years, with estimates that it will overtake the United States by 2039. I will now move on to some charts displaying the growth of gross domestic product. Here we have a plot of the estimated rise in China and India's per capita GDPs as a percentage of U.S. per capita GDP, according to Goldman Sachs research. This next graph displays both nominal and per capita GDP for China and India. China's growth is clearly rising more rapidly than the comparable measures for India's GDP growth. Moving on to the next two charts, which illustrate even more fully the phenomenal growth in China's GDP in both percentage change and total GDP. That chart is on the left. On the right of the screen, the graph displays China's percent share of world GDP growth. Clearly, these numbers are in China's favor. Lastly, this chart illustrates estimates when China and India's GDPs are expected to exceed those of today's rich countries.
Since the initiation of reform in 1979, China has become the world's fastest growing economy. From 1979 to 1999, China's gross domestic product grew at an average annual rate of 9.7%, the highest in the world during that period. Indicators like this give reason for many economists to speculate that China will likely become the world's largest economy sometime in the near future. The level of future economic growth will likely depend on the, on the, Chinese, on the Chinese government to make significant new reforms. Recently, recently, China has strategically altered some of its reforms and macro policy in order to maintain its high levels of growth, increase foreign direct investment, and to improve trade. For instance, in 2001, after much debate, China became a member of the World Trade Organization. By joining the WTO, China got immediate international recognition as a growing economic power. And joining the, w the WTO also gave China the ability to play a major role in the development, in the development of international rules on trade. And in fact, since joining the WTO in late 2001, China has already changed 2,300 laws or regulations on international trade. Goldman Sachs has estimated that the Chinese WTO membership will likely double China's trade and foreign investment levels and raise gross, matic, and raise gross domestic product growth by an additional 0.5% per year. Chinese leadership has also been undertaking major reforms of unprofitable state-owned enterprises, SOEs. Heavy government support of SOEs in the past has put a major strain on the Chinese government, on the Chinese economy, and cannot continue. As a result, the reform of SOEs has become a national priority. And in 1997, President Zemin stated that China was going to take steps to privatize all but one-third, one percent of its SOEs. Steps to reach this goal included the closing of many unprofitable state-owned enterprises and the merger of small, medium, and large profitable enterprises into very large conglomerates. This plan was slowed down in the late 1990s by the brief slowing of the Chinese economy but despite this hiccup, SOE reform remains to be a major priority among Chinese officials. Chinese expenditure priorities have also recently been shifted. In 2004, expenditure shifted from infrastructure construction in China to areas such as education, healthcare, social security, and agriculture. Much of this attention was shifted to the west and central regions of the country in order to aid the countries less fortunate. And as a related side note, I think it's important to reiterate at this point that since its initial reform in 1979, China has been able to pull 300 million of its citizens out of extreme poverty. And among this year's expenditures is a 14.7% boost in military spending, which will create entirely new um, job sectors for the country. China's banking system is often thought of as being flawed. However, at this, however, this is quite the contrary. Banking failures have estimated to be only one twelfth of that in the United States, and recently the central government announced that it would implement new reforms to enhance power of the central bank, for, to give power of the central bank over regional and state banks, and to improve management systems of all Chinese banks. Such reforms would attempt to lessen the power of local officials, put pressure on local banks in giving bad loans, and in addition, the government would indicate. The government has indicated that banks will likely be allowed to make bank loan decisions based on commercial considerations. One thing that hasn't changed recently in China is some of its monetary policy. China plans to keep the value of its currency, the yuan, competitively low in order to remain ahead in production markets and to encourage foreign direct investment, both of which are essential in the growth and the continued growth of China. Foreign direct investment, or FDI, is a country's stance in economic market. And China's recent trade and investment reforms has led to a surge in FDI to China. Chinese FDI grew from only 636 million in 1983 to an astounding 45.6 billion in 1998, and grew to an even more impressive 60.6 .6 billion last year, which was 10 times higher than the FDI India was able to yield in 2005. Foreign direct investment ranks as one of the best in the world, and in late 2002, A.T. Kearney Consulting Company listed China number one in attracting FDI. The fact is, is that China is indeed very attractive to foreign investors for several reasons, like its staggering growth rate over the last 25 plus years, its commitment to improving trade by joining the World Trade Organization, and China's enormous potential in cutting edge industries. 
And it's important to note that ultimately, trends and patterns of global FDI coming to coming to China has not shown that growth of FDI in other emerging markets, such as India, even affects China. As the largest developed country and the largest developing country, respectively, in the Pacific Asian region, the U.S. and China are highly complementary in their economic um, partnership and have great potential in, in their economic cooperation. In fact, this relationship is the pulse to which the global economy leads. Today, the U.S. is China's second largest trading partner and China America's fourth. As China's economic reform continues to intensify and the American economy further moves, the two will have even more to complement each other economically. Franklin Lavin, Undersecretary of Commerce for International Trade, described this partnership as the most important economic relationship of the 21st century. The most significant development in bilateral ties has been China's entry into the WTO. This win-win outcome provides even greater opportunities to both sides. The U.S. has been the largest source of realized foreign investment in China over the past three years in major industries such as electronics, telecommunications, textiles, pharmacy, finance, and insurance. China's markets for merchandise are far more open than commonly recognized. For example, in early 2001, China had cut its um, trade tariffs to 15.3 percent, half the level prevailing in India. As a result, actual tariff collections in China are extremely modest. China is now the global factory in the largest market, producing high-end goods to the delight of its consumers worldwide. On the heels of the news is that Chinese car maker Geely is entering the U.S. market, and word has emerged that more Chinese cars are due to arrive. VP of Geely Auto USA told the gathering of the Society of Automotive Analysis in Detroit that the company plans to introduce the $8,500 car into the U.S. as early as the fall of 2008. Geely also plans to release the Taishuan model, which was created by a team of women and includes brake pedal made to handle the spill of the As demand increases from the U.S. and international community for high quality Chinese goods, their demand for increased human rights is also felt. China has responded to these pressures from its foreign investors through labor reform. In 2001, the government in Yunnan province joined the International Labor Organization sponsored project to combat trafficking of women and children that aims to enroll former child laborers back in school. Like many factories in China, Shanghai Changjiang first implemented social compliance programs, known as CSRs, under the pressure from its buyer clients. The company is now reaping the benefits of social compliance, sustained growth, motivated employees, and satisfied clients. The case of Shanghai Changjiang shows that CSR has made headway in China. The case study was presented during the 2005 China Supply Conference. It represents the best practice in CSR program implementation by an emerging market country. The conference was attended by over 130 representatives from factories, sourcing agents, and brands engaged in the apparel and shoes industries. In conclusion, the epic transformations that have made China global economic power almost overnight are bound to continue. Chinese clearly realize that they must spread the wealth that only minority citizens in the coastal regions enjoy, and are taking steps to eliminate this inequity by changing the focus of their expenditure priorities in the rural sector. Their entry into the WTO, impeccable banking system, and symbiotic relationship with the U.S. guarantees their continued global success. India in no way can make a case that they are dominant emerging market today. All of their indicators fail miserably when compared to China. If India is losing today, they will surely be losing in the years to come. <laughs> Hence, China's fierce drive will likely remain a defined characteristic of China's ascension to global domination. Thank you. I'd like to now hand it over to John. Great. Um.
As recently as 15 years ago, India's economy was virtually closed. The Indian government was seeking to limit its dependence on the developed world, uh, due in part to the historic history of Britain. Then, in 1991, after decades of unstable and lackluster growth, it initiated economic reforms that have led it on its path to growth that it's on today. With uh, GDP growth rates of 2005 at 7.6%, and estimates for next year at 8.1%. This recent success in the Indian economy has uh, prompted a comparison with another regional upcomer, China. Um, this is a comparison of increasing international importance as these two states have become greater on the global scale. Uh, we intend to show you today that as you look towards the future, India, not China, as the best possible model and is best suited to become the next great economic power. Um, if you look at the headline figures as they are showed you, uh, China is, has an obvious advantage over India. It's economic dispute. But it would be unwise to judge the future growth of these two states solely on uh, headline figures. Um, it's from GDP growth to cement production. Um, India has a more advanced, more capable economic model for growth in the future. This model has created an economy that is more capable of long-term sustained growth. Um, part of the, one of the advantages that this model has created and been created by are things like its strong emphasis on higher education, its protection of physical and intellectual property rights, which we will law, and its stable political environment that has been helped by democratic institutions and low-level involvement by the government of the economy. Now, one thing that has made India's advancement of uh, the global economy that is so unique is its high emphasis on secondary education. In India, the government pays for 90% of all expenditures on higher education. There are 306 universities, over 15,000 colleges, in excess of 9 million students, um, which produces, uh, and India produces two, uh, 500 PhDs every year and 200,000 engineers, uh, which makes India's uh, education system the second largest in the world. But India's education system has more than just size of both of them. As you can see here on this graph, India in universities produces professionals that multinationals find suitable for employment at a rate almost twice as high as the developing world average and more than two and a half times higher than China. Another great example of India's uh, superiority in its quality of its education is the IIT system, the Indian Institute of Technology. The Indian Institute of Technology is a highly revered, very exclusive university that over 200,000 apply to each year, and only 2% of which are accepted. It was also ranked third best technological institute in the world by the Times Higher Education Supplement. Another reason uh, for India's uh, success, both academically and otherwise, is the prevalence of English. It is estimated that somewhere between 10, 20 and 10 percent of the Indian speakers, and this has led to their success in developing relationships with the developed world. Um, when looking at the development of an advanced economy, the role of the rule of law and the protection of uh, property rights cannot be overlooked in their importance. Um, in India, the protection of physical and intellectual property rights play a key role in the willingness of firms to invest in innovation and technological advancement. Um, India ensures that innovation will be protected through its property protection laws and its independent judiciary. Um, at a broader scale, one of the most important things to grow in the developing world is stability. In a dynamically changing economy, democratic institutions are uniquely suited to deal with the, uh, to create the stability required for future growth. One of the uh, consequences of growth in the order of 10 to 8 percent is the possibility for rising equity as uh, the wealth become more concentrated in the hands of the few. The possible consequences of which can be devastating to the state and its economy. While India continues to uh, have a stable economic system. China is uh, experiencing new levels of social unrest, with 87,000 reported mass instances last year, up 13,000 from the year before. Uh, China will continue to strive for and attain higher rates of economic growth.
but in doing so, it will not um, forfeit the fundamentals of its economic law, because these fundamentals are what allow Indy's economy to grow with stability to, to, to into the future. Um, another way that Indy's economy has fostered future growth is by creating an environment in which, unlike China, fosters the development of globally competitive domestic firms. <coughs> what India has done an outstanding job of is the, the incubation of a number of indigenous ways capable of competing on an international level. Most prominent are the IT source, uh, sources. Here are some of their figures. As you can see, these are multi-billion dollar corporations uh, with very high profit margins and tens of thousands of employees. They are also growing very fast. Most are projected by analysts uh, to grow around 30% this, uh, this year. These firms started out with low value commodity and price sensitive operations such as call centers and data processing. But they keep climbing the value chain and are offering higher value added and complex services. A milestone was reached last year when Indian IT firms won large portions of a $2.2 billion IT contract with the European banking giant Avian Amer. It has shown that Indian firms are capable of competing with world class firms such as IBM and Accenture at the highest level, at the most sophisticated level of IT services, competing consulting contracts with major multinationals. Indian IT firms are also acquiring US firms to strengthen their position. Wipro bought Nerdwire and AMS last year. Indian's IT industry has also had success with software startups. Last year, Oracle bought a 60% share in the Indian banking software startup iFlex in a deal valuing the company at 650 million. There are also successful indigenous Indian companies in the biotech industry. Their path is very similar to Indian IT firms. Companies started out reverse engineering Western drugs and producing generics. Today, they are moving to develop their own proprietary drugs. Redbacks has 300 scientists working on 10 research programs, and Dr. Reddy is aiming to bring its own proprietary diabetes medicine in the year 2010. Indigenous companies play a very critical role in development, with the exception of tiny island nations such as Ireland and Singapore. No country is successfully industrialized without their presence. All developing countries will initially compete on low factor costs, cheap labor, subsidized land, and, incent and tax incentives. Indigenous companies will upgrade their labor forces. As wages rise, they will move price sensitive operations to other countries. They allow a country to climb the value chain, develop more advanced competitive advantage, and escape the brutal price competition of labor intensive industries. It is interesting to note that you cannot even find world class Chinese companies, even in industries that they should dominate, such as labor intensive in industries such as shoes, clothing, and furniture. Many want to argue that China will in time. But Turkey and China both started garment manufacturing in the late 90s, 1970s. Today, Turkey has large manufacturers with an international presence. They conduct research and development, design their own clothes, and hold fashion shows. Chinese manufacturer, manufacturers are still doing the low-end work such as processing and manufacturing. China has relied almost entirely on foreign multinationals to grow its economy, using its low factor costs to lure manufacturing operations. It has had a lot of success with this model and experienced very rapid growth. However, this model can only get a country so far as it simply does not provide a country with an enduring competitive advantage. Long term, it is unwise for a country to rely on cheap factor costs alone, as it is inevitable that it will be undercut by other nations. A good historical precedent of a failure of this model is NAFTA in Mexico. The country had high hopes after the treaty was signed and did experience some initial success. Multinationals flocked to Mexico to take advantage of its cheap factor costs to export manufactured goods to the United States. At their peak, this export industry employed over 1.3 million workers in Mexico. However, the success was short-lived as other countries emerged to undercut the country. Over the past few years, over 500 factories have been closed and an estimated 400,000 jobs lost. Multinationals are entirely profit-oriented, and they will move their manufacturing operations to the, to the location and the mode with the lowest overall cost. Ten years ago, it was Mexico. Today, it is China. In time, other countries will emerge to undercut China. India will not suffer from this, as its companies are more loyal to their home country. They are upgrading their, the Indian workforce beyond unskilled laborers and entering industries that are less price sensitive. With a population of 1.3 billion, many will say that China doesn't, will not experience labor cost problems for a long time. It does have a workforce of 800 million, but only a fraction are usable. Export-oriented firms strongly prefer to hire women between the ages of 18 and 25 or those experienced operating machinery. And China for several years has been cutting taxes on rural income which is depleting a good source of cheap migrant workers. 
The quality of, China, the quality of education in China is extremely low. For every 10 candidates in areas such as accounting, engineering, and finance, only one is suited to work for multinationals. The minimum wage is increased by 25% in cities with major export industries. There are already reports of labor shortages. According to official government numbers, firms are looking to hire over a million additional workers, but not find workers to fill them. Turnover is also rising. It went from 8.3% in 2001 to 11, 14% last year. Also last year, salaries rose 8.4%. Many believe that China is following the same export-led growth model that Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan so successfully used to industrialize. However, this view is extremely overly simplistic, as the lack of indigenous companies will place a cap on Chinese economic development. At this point, population has been one of China's major advantages. Its ability to both attract multinationals for economic influence is simple. More people mean more workers. And the total output Multinationals are literally climbing over each other to access China's market of 1.3 billion consumers. However, this is very short-sighted. China is the world's fastest engaging population and will in fact join, join the growing populations of the industrialized nations. With their lethargic birth rates and rapidly growing elderly populations, we believe that we are seeing an end to the golden period of extremely low-cost labor in China. There are plenty of workers, but the supply of unskilled workers is shrinking. India is, and will remain for some time, one of the youngest countries in the world. A third of India's population was below 15 years of age in 2000. In 2020, the average Indian will be 29 years old compared to 37 in China. The demographic process that this implies will create a large, growing labor force which is expected to deliver spin-offs in terms of growth and prosperity. A report by Goldman Sachs predicts that India will be the only economy constantly growing in excess of 5% annually into the year 2050. But China instituted one-child policy in 1979. The advantage of this policy has helped these pressures on resources and reduced poverty, but has had a very detrimental effect on demographics and will increasingly put a damper on their economy. The results of these will be profound. China's workforce will actually peak in seven years in 2013. This will put enormous pressure on wages and erode China's low wage advantage. China will experience the same problem uh, by, by, by the population increase, except it will be more accentuated. By 2025, China's median age will be much higher than in America. China will age faster than any other country in history. More worryingly, China will get old before it gets rich. When Japan had the same portion of population over the age of 65 as China does now, its GDP per capita was three times higher. In 2025, 13.4% of China's population will be over 65. And as you can see here, the graph states that it breaks down into age brackets, the Chinese population. And as the model projects into the future, uh, the elder population will actually grow rapidly and uh, worsen China's population programs more and more. The situation in India could not be more different. The window of opportunity offered, offered by population bulge has opened up a huge market for India. India's workforce will increase for at least another 20 years. Since India did not have the extensive population control programs, it will age much more gracefully. Following on the lines of pro uh, on progress, India's youthfulness is expected to substantially increase the saving rates in the country, while also encouraging a flow of capital from aging nations that would seek investment in high growth regions. What this means is that there, is, there are more workers being employed, an increase in total output, and a substantial economic influence being shifted towards India. And in conclusion, we uh, believe that for all the uh, we believe that India, and absolutely not China, is best suited to become the next great economic power. As you reflect on what we have said today, we would like you to remember this is not a debate about the size of these two nations' economies today. And while these quantitative numbers are important, they must only be seen as a piece of the puzzle. This debate is about future growth. This debate is about domestic versus foreign multinationals, about growing versus shrinking labor forces, about democratic versus authoritarian regimes, about sustainable versus unsustainable growth. For these forward-looking reasons, we believe that India will be the next great economic power.
you're now ready to begin our rebuttals. Michael, you're ready. Slogan was India shining. 
This party was swept from office only to be replaced by a coalition led by the left front, an alliance of parties that has been fiercely critical of corporate globalization. For all the reasons we have discussed tonight, it becomes clear that China will prove in the years to come that it is the more durable economic power and is ready to, and in fact already is, playing a crucial and significant role in the global economic landscape. Again, I would like to thank all the alumni in attendance tonight, as well as the faculty and students for showing their support. But most importantly, this debate and the revitalization of the Undergraduate Economics Club would not have been possible without the tireless work of Jonathan Cohen. So thank you. Um, a point the other team keeps bringing up is the FBI numbers, where China's figures are about 10 times as large as India. These numbers are greatly exaggerated and very misleading for several reasons. For first, China gives very favorable tax treatment to foreign companies. This has made it very tempting for domestic Chinese companies to simply channel investment through uh, Hong Kong and the Cayman Islands, a practice known as ground tripping. So a lot, huge proportion of their FDI is simply domestic Chinese companies going through Hong Kong and the Cayman Islands as, uh, as investment. A 2002 report by the World Bank estimates that this accounts for 30 and, between 30 and 50 percent of FDI. Also, China, China's FDI is for factories and machinery, which by their very nature are capital intensive. India is for um, offices, which and is knowledge based, so it doesn't require as much capital. Also, India has a number of, uh, of, of IT firms that can get IT contracts from multinationals, meaning that multinationals can offshore their operations without directly investing in India. Second, FDI, FDI should not be viewed as a holy grail of development. Um, the, 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 FDI, the FDI numbers of China is purely because of its low labor costs, so it should be viewed inherently as temporary and unstable. India does not need FDI because, as much because its, multi its domestic companies are capable of investing in itself. China is simply over de uh, dependent on FDI. Uh, I want to touch on a couple of points you guys are talking about here. Uh, you were mentioning elderlies as an asset. Figures I have are saying that 10 Chinese workers will need to support seven Chinese people, either too young or too old to work. Now that doesn't seem too good for me. And it's interesting how you touch on uh, Chinese success in the automotive industry. Um, a little interesting report I read, uh, Geely failed American safeties and emissions tests and uh, due to poor design. And, and you know, they're facing a lot of problems and, and, and they're gonna have a really hard time breaking into the US market. And actually, Add to that point, Honda, GM, and Toyota filed for patent infringement. Now, I don't know how good you guys are going to do, but uh, you know, that's just one of my points. And also, you know, to touch on another point here, India is far more superior to China when it comes to telecommunications. Costs has dropped over 85% over the last three years, and 23.5% of businesses operating in China see telecom as a significant hindrance versus only 5% in India. And since 2003, infrastructure spending has actually increased 17 billion in 2003 to 24 billion in 2005, and is expected to increase by 47 billion by 2009. That's almost a 300% increase in just seven years. I'd like to bring up a few things. You guys mentioned the, uh, or I think you marginalized the, uh, the failures in the banking system, if I may say so. Um, state owned enterprises are putting a, a phenomenal uh, amount of pressure on the banking system in China. Uh, these, bank, these SLEs are not profitable, so they have to be getting new loans whenever they need more money. And since they're not profitable, they have no way of getting more money, so they're just going to get more loans, they're going to get old And so this, cycle has created an extremely large amount of non-performing loans in India. It is estimated that the numbers are going to in China. That somewhere between 25 and 50% of all loans in China are non-performing. And it's also estimated that some this amount of non-performing loans could amount to somewhere between 25 and 50% of total GDP per year in China. Now, 
You mentioned that the banks fail at very low rate time. Well, see, that's not really necessarily the point, because most of these loans are put out by state-owned banks, and they don't need to fail to be putting a lot of uh, be making some serious problems in the economy. It's tightening up capital in the country, making it more expensive, and making smaller companies much, making it harder for smaller companies to get capital and grow. Um, I'd also like to talk about, since you guys are so keen on numbers, a growth rate that you had and you didn't mention, which is uh, over the past decade, social unrest has grown in the country each year by no less than 9%. Um, since 1993, it's grown tenfold from 87 8,700 mass instances, which are instances with more than 50 people long sittings or strikes or stuff like that. Um, to 87. Oh, yeah. um, all right. Um, also, I'd like to say that this is caused by rising equity in uh, China. Um, your your uh, consumption numbers are extremely low for developed countries. India's about 60% of GDP consumption. China's about 40%. It's actually 30. Uh, it's, it's actually, yeah, four years now. Thank you for both teams. Team India would also like to thank Mandy Singh for her help, her help as a research assistant. I'd like to talk about infrastructure for a minute. I, I think what you 
focused on was increasingly this idea of education. And it strikes me that once you get outside of the coastal area of China, shipping goods and services is a non-trivial activity. I didn't hear anything regarding highway development, railroad development, and other infrastructures that would improve, quote unquote, exploiting the labor that's located inside. Could you speak to logistical highway and those kinds of systems what the plans are? Well, sure. I mean, I don't know exact figures on highway expenditure, but China's expenditure on infrastructure construction has increased in the last decade or so. And their, their transportation system is set up to accommodate major tractor trailers such as the United States and the interstate system that was in place here. And throughout the country, I think they're going to be able to transport well with the development of their infrastructure. I also um, I mentioned the, they just ratified the 11th five-year plan. Um, another aspect of this, it's a pretty long plan, so I can't you know, get into full detail, but one of the goals of their plan is to share this wealth that they've begun to accumulate and share it with, because most of the growth has been on the coastal areas, as you mentioned, but China is conscientious about you know, the rest of their country. It's an enormous country, um, ma mainly agricultural once you get away from the coastline. But the success on the coastal areas is something that they want to, in our, you know, in this coming five years, we'll see as this plan is enacted and carried out that they will, you know, distribute and share this wealth so that the people um, outside of the coastal regions can benefit from their growth. Uh, I had a, just a question relative to the rule of law. Uh, Is, is that the, the industrialized world largely operates on a pretty common uh, set of laws, uh, particularly around uh, property, uh, intellectual property in particular. Uh, and certainly in the industry I'm in, uh, there's a pretty big hesitance of the technology industry to outsource to China because of fears of our intellectual property rights, uh, where in India that's uh, certainly a risk, but a much lower risk. And given the political structure in China, you know, how does how do you give foreign internationals companies confidence that our intellectual property rights will be uh, guaranteed going forward? And if you know ten years down the line you don't like where things are going, then you just say no, we're not following those rules anymore. Well, I mean, you know, it, it is true that China does not have the intellectual property right enforcement that most of the rest of the world does. But I, I think that's something that hopefully we'll see in the next five years, is they, under, they can understand that to be receptive to this you know, foreign investment, um, you know, foreign influence companies investing in China, using their services, that if they don't, uh, you know, if they don't agree with and abide by these laws, then companies won't outsource and use, um, and use the skills that their workers possess because you know, companies don't want to lose what they've created um, you know, software-wise. Um, so I, I think that's something they, they have to recognize because if they don't, then they don't have the opportunity to attract the type of you know, foreign investment.
the projected strong growth in military spending would be positive for economic development and economic growth. And I, I guess that struck me as a little puzzling. Um, it, it certainly didn't seem to work for the, the Soviet Union, um, when they called the Soviet Union. And some would attribute the very rapid growth in the United States in the 90s to the freeing up of engineering talent as the Clinton administration wound down uh, military spending pretty dramatically. You sort of make a case of why accelerating well, sure. I mean, I think, well, first to get to your point about the United States in the 1990s, I think that was a, a period of great timing and, I mean, decreased um, spending of, yeah, in all areas was, was just a great timing. And the IT industry just boomed during the 1990s. I mean, the United States essentially got lucky. Well, not lucky, but I mean, they did very well at that time. And um, I think increased expenditure, increased military expenditure in China can create jobs for, I mean, the rural sector, the, the production markets of, of military I mean, goods. I mean, what you need to supply your military, and it's just going to increase the, the manufacturing of those goods. Uh, the second question relates to, and it gets to the population issue. It's you know it is a, just a wonderful statistic that 300 million Chinese have been pulled out of uh, poverty, but I, I think uh, much of that has been the movement of the Chinese population from farming or, or a, a rural environment to an urban environment, and I, my understanding of that movement is getting increasingly difficult. Um, because whereas China has instituted property rights for real estate in urban areas, and I guess that's how they're creating so many billionaires, it's a lot of Donald Trumps in China now. Um, what they haven't done is instituted any kind of property rights uh, for farmland. And I think of those you know, 87,000 mass incidences, probably 86,999 have been peasants that don't like their land getting ripped off. And so could you comment, it, it seems for the growth story to continue, there needs to be a smoother uh, transition of taking more and more uh, people off the land since the, there is really no organic growth in the, in the population as a whole right now. Sure, I mean, it's, it's also important to reiterate the fact that, I mean, as of 2004 and prior to then, reform of the um, expenditure priority shifted to the central and western regions of the country, the poor areas of the country, and, and provided money for their education, for their agriculture subsidies, for their health care, and for their social security. So they're just strengthening their weaker, their weaker part of the country. And yeah, again, I'll say, um, you know, it's been within the past month that they um, ratified the 11 five-year plan, and a lot of the goals of this plan are to share the wealth. You know, in, in 1978, when the reform started, they began phasing out the practice of collectivized agriculture. Um, you know, and I, again, I said it, you can't call China an emerging economy because it's the second largest in the world, but it's emerging in the sense that it has to reform its society, and they understand that, you know, there are 1.3 billion people in that country, and they have to take care of them. And if the wealth is coming from the coastal areas, then that wealth needs to be shared with the rest of the country so everyone can prosper. And I, you know, I, I think this, the next five years will be a, you know, a big phase in China's history because you know, they've started to look at things like services, um, health care, um, and really you know, sharing the prosperity that they've enjoyed in the past you know, couple decades. Okay, I have one more question uh, for the China team. Uh, the, the number was thrown out about 85,000 incidents, social incidents, uh, in the country. And clearly, it's a country that that type of growth, tremendous uh, social tensions have been created. And it, we identified 85,000. There's not a whole lot of free press and flow of communication over in China. So my guess is it's probably even something more than that. Um, 
And apparently this is accelerating fairly, fairly quickly. But how are they going to deal with that? Over, throughout another five or 10 years in the future, when the 85,000 is 500,000, how are they going to deal with, uh, with that type of social unrest? Well, I think part of the 14.7% increase in military expenditure will be used <laughs> domestically. Should the president? <laughs> An excellent answer. Thank you. <laughs> well, again, I mean, hopefully, you know, in the next five years, you know, the goals of their plan are to, as I mentioned just before, to share, you know, the prosperity, and hopefully, you know, these poor peasant farmers can now, you know, um, stand to gain from the coastal areas' prosperity.
that in the next few years, 30% of new doctors in the United States are going to be from India. Uh, so how, if you're going to maintain your momentum and growth, uh, that's something you have to do to stem the tide of the brain rate going on currently, or all the best and brightest are going to leave the country and, and go to the Western uh, countries where, where there's just much more opportunity monetarily for them. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the term brain drain um, because actually we see it as an advantage because you're actually having Indians coming to predominantly the United States for their education. Uh, they're getting the skills they need uh, to build up a successful business perhaps as engineers, technicians in the various sources of uh, IT bio, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And actually what they're doing is once they've built up a, found, uh, a sound foundation in the United States, they will actually go back to India and start their own firms there. And that way, not only are they prospering uh, themselves, but they're also making India prosper by adding this wealth of knowledge to their country, which will increase uh, their economy as time goes on. I guess first I'd uh, like to uh, offer very small, little criticism uh, about your assertion that, that China didn't have any uh, globally competitive companies. I, I think if you were to ask John Chambers who Cisco's greatest competitor is uh, in the world, he'd probably not say Juniper, but probably say Huawei, um, which I, I think is building amazing products. Uh, and it's indigenous, um, it, but okay. I, I guess my um, question is more non-tangible, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that growth in China exploded uh, once Hong Kong uh, was integrated into China. Um, you know, you, I've had the good fortune of being to Hong Kong a few times, and. Uh, I've never been any place on the planet where entrepreneurialism uh, was as you know, all-consuming from getting in a taxi, uh, you know, that starts right there, everything's a negotiation. Um, and